a very good morning one and all present here myself lokesh bhat it gives me immense pleasure to receive you all at the 22nd edition of tech fest iit bombay which is asia's largest science and technology festival uh, let's start this event with some fun yeah बहाने लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन पुट योर हैंड्स टुगेदर अगेन फॉर वन ऑफ द फाइनेस्ट अंपायर्स साइमन टॉफिल नमस्ते बहाने बहाने Not out. Not out. Sachin was batting. Not out. <laughs> Here you go. Sir, now the stage is all yours. Don't you what? <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming today. It's a real honour and a privilege to be with you and amongst friends and colleagues. It's great that cricket unites us and brings us together as for, for special events like this. Um, at the risk of finding out what you don't want to hear would you like to hear some cricket stories yes would you like to hear what it takes to get to be number 1 in the world yes would you like to hear about technology in cricket yes would you like to hear at Kohli's phone number <laughs> well i can promise some of those but probably not the last one i'm not sure virat would be too happy with me if i did that <laughs> to learn and engage but could i ask you please to turn your phones to flight mode okay please turn your phones to flight mode because we're going to take off very shortly and start this session so with that majay me raho <laughs> so let's have fun let's enjoy this tiger Okay. Firstly, I'd like to start by saying that we have some things in common. I started out by saying in my introduction that cricket unites us and brings us together, and that's one of the great things about this special game. It's a common language, it's a common love, it's something that we share together. As students of this technology institute, and what a famous and prestigious institute that it is you and i have something in common as well it's the search for getting better it's the search for going places where no one's been before and it's that struggle and strive to be leaders in our own field that's really really important so can i please get you to connect with that we have this in common as well we also have this tremendous ability to embrace challenges through that you and i have both failed a lot we've both got things that are wrong in our pursuit of actually getting to where we want to get to and we don't know how good we can be until we try so at the end of this session i'm going to give you three main learnings and tips and tools for you to take away and i'd love you to walk out of this room with at least one thing that's going to help you to reach your potential and go beyond does that sound okay yes. tiger still with me yes. okay the plane's about to take off flight mode has been done yes. push okay this is a question i often get and i like to start a session with is why did i take up umpiring why did i take up umpiring Hope so that lucky's. Nay. Nay. This is not why I took up umpiring. <laughs> Although it is interesting looking at this gentleman. <laughs> it is interesting looking at this. 
not everyone is looking at the camera. <laughs> but if you look at me, I'm looking at the camera <laughs> and my hands. So this is not one of the reasons I took up umpiring. <laughs> I did not take up umpiring for the money. I did not take up umpiring to be a full-time umpire. I did start to get some pocket money because it was a, a hobby, if you like. But I did not take up umpiring to become rich. You hopefully have chosen your course at this institute to be something special, to be following a career choice that you love and to be able to go the extra mile and to test your personal boundaries. If you are attending this university and taking on a career choice to be super rich, that will not make you very successful. I also did not take up umpiring for the awards. At no stage did I put on the Superman suit and get out there and perform for the pursuit of an award. Umpiring is a team sport and when you go out there to work in your business, you are going to be bigger by actually contributing to a team. And it's very important that these individual awards reflect team success. So my colleagues who have worked with me, my coaches, my family, the people that have helped me along the way, get recognition through those types of events. But I stress, I do not take up umpiring for those awards. They're nice and they're special, but that's not the reason I took up umpiring. I took up umpiring because I wanted a challenge. It started out as a hobby. It became a part-time job. And then I started to get more and more work. And then it became a full-time job. And now, ogia. <laughs> Katam, kalas. And I get to do special things like come and talk to young people who like to follow and chase their dreams. And part of what I'd like to do is to share those experiences and lessons with you so that you can achieve your potential. Tigger? I then get asked, what is life like as an umpire? So I've chosen some photographs today to help explain and share some of those stories with you. Our conditions in India, Bhut Karam. Bhut Karam. Very, very challenging. And one of the things that's really important for us to do is to look at after ourselves physically and mentally, but to be able to cope with those particular environmental challenges to make sure that we can concentrate. So I was talking to your professor and dean uh, backstage earlier on today, and he asked me the question, well, what does fitness look like for you? And for us, it's about stamina. It's about hydration. It's about core strength. It's about looking after your back. And it's about being flexible. So to be able to cope with those challenging conditions on the field of play, we need to make sure that physically we're in good shape. So those conditions are very, very challenging. I don't mind the heat, but tender, hot tender, no good. Wellington, Hobart, Dunedin, Durham, hot tender, don't like it. One of the other challenges is working with lots of different colleagues, some senior, old enough to be my father. <laughs> some are the same age and some are in between. 
and they come from different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, and you have to learn to be able to work with all of them. And that's one of the real challenges. Different personality types. So as you go about working with your colleagues in this university and institute, and as you go out into the workforce, that's a real special and unique skill that you're going to have to develop. You don't have to like everyone, but you have to learn how to work with everyone. Same with the captains that I work with, and that may be a, a question later on. All these different environments provide different challenges. What a unique challenge we all had this morning coming here. Shifting from over there to over here at the last minute. Yeah? So well done for you to make that journey and for the people that are sitting on the floor. I really sympathise with you. I really do. So venues, yesterday afternoon we did a venue inspection for the other hall. We went through our preparation. All, all we had to change. Um, this one here was taken in Faisalabad and there was a massive explosion when I was doing a test match between Pakistan and England and this massive explosion happened on the side of the field and we had no idea what it was. So we decided to get out of there and we left the field. And you might remember that's the test match where Shia Afridi decided to do some skating down the middle of the pitch as we left the field. So these things are sent to try us and they do happen. So life is tough on the field when you have to contend with things like that and I'm very big on preparation but how do you prepare for a bomb blast on the side of the field <laughs> from a gas tank? <laughs> now this one here, do you know who this man is? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, not Bumrah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Munaf Patel. Acha. And do you know who this man is? Awai Shah. Who said Awai Shah? Well done. Good job. Now, this was a test match, I think, in 2006 between England and India at uh, Wankhede Stadium. Probably the longest five days of my life. <laughs> now, I talked about preparation. So part of my preparation in being a cricket umpire is to learn some different languages. Learn how to count to six in Hindi. Eg do tin cha panch te saat at ne dos. And part of that preparation also involves knowing the good words. <laughs> and the bad words. So life on the cricket field presents a number of challenges. So in this particular event, as you can see, Owe Shah is not too happy. Why do you think that might be? Munaf has said something to him. Sledging. What do you think Munaf might have said to Owe Shah? Any ideas? Okay. So, Munaf was getting quite frustrated at Owe Shah and at some stage said to Owe Shah, Salah <laughs> Chutia. <laughs> so, That left me with a problem. <laughs> that left me with a problem. So as Munaf comes back past me, I say to Munaf, you cannot say that. <laughs> I think Munaf was more surprised that I knew what he said <laughs> than the fact I was talking to him about the issue. Now, I'm a big believer that breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. This was a breakdown moment between two players and potentially a breakdown moment between the bowler and the umpire. 
Now, at, the, at that time, it was a difficult situation. Because of the relationship that we've now got, every time Munaf and I see each other, we go, Hello, Salah. <laughs> On the field, we also have some very good moments. Now, at the time, I got very sore arms. <laughs> very sore arms. And, of course, I wasn't thinking about six sixes at the time. I was thinking about one ball at a time and umpiring that ball to the best of my ability, one thing at a time. I was keeping it simple. But, as we now know, six sixes happened and you are now part of history. That is a real privilege to be part of history. And it's a fond memory that I look back on and something that we share. So, as you can see, life of the umpire on the field has all sorts of different challenges, both good and bad. And what they all produce, though, are learning opportunities and things that you can grow from. Then people ask me, what is life like as an umpire off the field? So, I'm going to share a couple of stories with you about that. This is a photo back in 2003 during my first World Cup in South Africa. And it happened in a place called Gweru in Zimbabwe. And I was given the privilege of walking with the lions. Yes, I've still got two hands, <laughs> two legs, all fingers attached. So nothing to worry about. It all turned out OK. But not too many people get the privilege and honour of walking with the lions. We did that. That was special. We also get to have some relaxation time. This was in the West Indies, and it's a great place to play cricket. It's also a great place to have a day off. And so Mark Benson and I got used to working on our, our suntans. I've been lucky enough to get to the Taj Mahal a couple of times. Has everyone been to the Taj Mahal? Put your hand up if you've been to the Taj Mahal. If you have not been to the Taj Mahal, you must go. It is a special, special place. It is fantastic. It's rich in culture, rich in history, and it's everything that you think it's going to be. You must go. It is worth the four-hour drive from Delhi or Jaipur. Worth. Please go. And to be able to share that experience with my team during the World Cup on this occasion, I've been twice by the way, to be able to share that with people who are in my team makes it even more special. And as you can see, the World Cup in 2011 was quite a colourful, quite a colourful team. This one down here. Now, this happened, who's this man? Danny Morrison? No. He's an umpire. Don't know. Okay, it's Daryl Harper. Daryl Harper. Or as we say, Daryl No Hair. Daryl Harper. So Daryl and I, Daryl taught me actually how to be a better tourist around cricket by embracing the culture of where we went to and helping me to embrace um, the places that we went to and things to do and people to see, etc. And I didn't know at the time what these were. We went out shopping in Kanpur, we went to the bazaar, and we saw this stall and we both bought one of these hats. And we walked back from the bazaar to the hotel and all of the people that we walked past were just laughing at us. We didn't know that we were now married to each other. <laughs> I've still got that at home. I still have that at home. Good memories. Uh, life off the field like an umpire. Uh, I was lucky enough to take my family away with me for a couple of trips to the UK and to Sri Lanka and those sorts of places. I hope one day to bring them to India. But this was my last series uh, T20 World Cup in 2012 and I was lucky enough to have my whole family with me on that time. So having my family with me is a real bonus, 
Sometimes it's a distraction. <laughs> Sometimes it's a bonus. But I was lucky enough to have my family with me for my last ICC cricket tournament. And they got to experience what I do. So they got to experience traffic in the subcontinent. <laughs> OK, driving. And life off the cricket field has also got its privileges like meeting the Dalai Lama the other day and also meeting this gentleman. Who is this man? <laughs> Your Supreme Leader, Mr Jaren Narendra Modi. And that was nice too. And so we are privileged off the field to be able to do some things that a lot of people can't. So they're very humbling experiences. Remember I'd said, I'm going to give you some tips and some tools about how to get to number, the, number one in the world of what you want to do? Pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Okay. What did we learn? Here are some more pictures which I'd like to run through. Now, who is the man on the right? Anyone know? No, it's not Maria Erasmus. No, it's not... Um, it's not an umpire. He's no one famous, by the way. But what he is, he was our close protection officer during the 2011 Cricket World Cup. He was the man charged with responsibility for looking after us during that tournament. Pretty impressive figure, hey? <laughs> Would you go close to him? No. So when he was training and doing his workout, I thought I'd give this a go too. And it was hard. <laughs> it was very hard. There was no way in the world I was going to make some biceps like he had. But one of the things that I've learned in my journey of being a cricket umpire and getting to the top of my field was you always need to look for new information. You always need to try new things. And you need to do things that you've never done before. That was an interesting experience. And I learnt something from that around exercise and looking after your body. But I had a go. I tried something new. I look at the people around me that I can learn from. David Shepherd. David Shepherd, a very good man. And I did my first... India-Pakistan series with David in 2004 after the two countries had not played for a long time. So David and I did a couple of test matches in that series. And what struck me about David was his ability <coughs> to build relationships across different cultures and to earn respect from almost every participant because of the type of human being that he was. He had tremendous communication skills and relationship building skills. And he earned people's respect. And I learned from David that it's not just being about a good umpire. You also have to be a good person. And having those personal skills to be human, to make mistakes, to apologise, to congratulate, to lead from behind, David was that type of person. Also, I learnt in my journey that we have to train and work very hard when no one else is watching. This is a third umpire simulation activity that we did in Nagpur. And we're training in this environment to make as many mistakes as we can when it doesn't matter. So making a mistake on game day is not good. Making a mistake in here, Tigger. I've also been very lucky to operate at a level where it's not just about world-class umpiring, but what can I learn from world-class players? What can I learn from world-class coaches? World-class physios? World-class dietitians? Because every team on the international stage has the best 
has the elite. So ask yourselves in this room here, who can I learn from that's at this IIT campus? Where are my networks and where are my colleagues that I can learn from the best? And don't be afraid to ask that question because that's how you get better. So sometimes I'd ask a question and sometimes he'd ask me a question which is helping and learning from each other. This was a situation, Mahela Jayawardena, who is now coach of the Mumbai Indians. Who's going to win IPO this year, by the way? Mumbai. Chennai? Mumbai? 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 I think Mumbai are favourites. So, imagine what it's like umpiring a game where in the one team you've got four captains. You've got four captains in the one team. And two of them are at the wicket in the same team. Who do I talk to? But, um, Mahela was the type of captain who would challenge. He would hold you to account. He expected good performance. And he pushed me. I had to know my stuff. I had to be on top of my game. And he also gave me situations where there was a fair amount of conflict and challenge. If you get through those moments, it gives you tremendous self-belief and confidence. We don't often talk enough about self-belief and confidence that comes from you. Yes, you can prepare, and that gives you confidence. You know when you've done the work and when you haven't. So when you walk into that exam room and you haven't done the work, you feel pretty nervous, don't you? When you've done the work and you feel good, you have that confidence, you've still got some little bit of nerves, but you're fairly confident this exam will go okay. So have a think about confidence and self-belief and self-talk. I can do this. I will umpire well, I can umpire well, I am going to umpire well. What does that look like in your language walking into an exam or a job interview? What do you say to yourself? Relax, stay calm, I can do this. Positive self-talk, really, really important. Kush? What's up, Kush? Acha. Okay, I promised you we would talk a little bit about some technology in cricket. Who knows what DRS stands for? Decision review system? No. The what, sorry? The Dhoni review system. No. What else? What else does DRS stand for? Yes? What does... I can't hear you, I'm an umpire. Decision review system. Good try, but no. Digital review system, no. And it doesn't stand for the Dravid removal system either. <laughs> it stands for Don't Ring Simon. Okay, now, you know the technology has come a long way and it keeps getting better every day. You've only got to look at your mobile phones. Not now. Look at our laptops, our personal devices. The speed of the internet. Television. Broadcasting. It's very expensive to keep up with modern technology. Cricket is no different. It changes all the time. The only constant in the world at the moment is change. We have to learn how to adapt and to keep up and to adjust. In 1990, it looks fairly primitive, doesn't it? You've got an old TV, 
basic monitor, a two-way radio, and hopefully a bit of luck. This is where we are today. I'll show you another slide a bit later on. But you can see that it's completely different. You've got high definition monitor, you've got a HD feed, you've got another program monitor there, you've got off to the side you've got a fruit machine. Does anyone know what a fruit machine is? Fantastic, good man. So this is what looks after the commentators. You think the commentators are really intelligent, don't you? <laughs> the commentators are given this TV monitor which says runs, wickets, overs, partnership, number of overs with the current ball, when the last ball's about to be bowled. It gives them all these stats. You think, how do they know all this? It's because it's on the fruit machine. Also, too, down the bottom here we have a high-definition communications box which allows the third umpire to talk to the director and vice versa. When things go wrong, there's a button there for the engineer. Are there any engineers in the room, by the way? <laughs> Just a couple? <laughs> Mechanical, electrical, chemical? Yep. There's also a communications technician in the room. So he looks after umpire comms live to air. He makes sure that nothing that's said in the room goes outside of the room except when there's a DRS. Remember, don't ring Simon. And apart from all that, you've got a match referee who's keeping you honest and doing the assessment. So it's quite different, isn't it? So this role here is not just about decision making. That third umpire also double checks the ball count, double checks the over count, watches the TV for player behaviour breaches, manages delays and stoppages and over rates for the on-field umpires. Does a lot. Third umpire is the hardest job in the cricket team these days. It's the hardest job. And technology is getting quicker, faster, and in some ways it's complicating our lives a bit more, isn't it? If we let it. What about social media? Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp? There's buckets of them. I'll come back to that later. So, just going to talk briefly about some of these technology tools that currently exist. Hotspot. We don't see it too much in India because it's a military form of technology, infrared technology. So the government is very careful about not including this technology in some parts of the world. But sometimes you can have up to four hotspot cameras at a cricket match. So picture this. You're out there in the middle umpiring a game of cricket and you've got 31 television cameras watching you. 31. And then on top of that, you've got another four hotspot cameras. And then on top of that, you've got another six Hawkeye cameras. How are we feeling? Hey, is that challenging? So, two eyes up against over 40 cameras. Doesn't seem fair, does it? We go back to those earlier slides about why I took up umpiring. So we can have outside, offside hotspot, we can have leg side hotspot, we can have front on, end on hotspot. Sometimes there's one camera, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's char. It's challenging. And sometimes there's no hotspot. Sometimes the batteries are run out. Sometimes technology isn't always perfect. And as a cricket umpire, as a third umpire, you've got to know when it's not perfect. And so when it's not perfect, we go to this. So within technology that you guys and girls might be working on, you have what's called a redundancy factor. So if one form of technology doesn't work, we go down to the next level. So this is the next level. This is what the process looks like. 
Because sometimes if there's no hotspot, then we go to RTS. Snicko. And it's not just about this. Because what I'll talk about in a minute is technology is there to support human beings. It's not there to replace human beings. So when you are designing technology, I get you to think about do not get technology to replace human beings, but to support them. This is a spike. However, the ball also has to be near the bat because you don't know what's causing that spike. It's very, very important that the spike matches next to where the ball is hitting the bat or the glove. Does that make sense? Now that's a human judgment. So we have to look at that split screen to make sure that it all makes sense. Now if all that technology fails, then we go on to this one. Ball tracking. Do you know that there's actually two companies used in cricket that have ball tracking? You may not have known that. So in Australia, they're not using Hawkeye for ball tracking. They're using Virtual Eye, which is a New Zealand-based company. So there's ball tracking, and then there's ball tracking. So these people go through rigorous testing, but at the end of the day, this blue line here, it's a predictive path. It's not fact, it's a predictive path. These cameras that track the ball, they're up to 300 frames per second. 300 frames per second. And so all that data from the shots of the ball side on and front on, photo, 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 ball pitched, and then photo, 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 impact. And then we calculate using a mathematical formula, physics, what the ball was most likely to do next. But it is a prediction. And we sit there in the armchair and we make our own assessment, don't we? So once we've got hotspot, once we've got snicko, and once we've got ball tracking, if all those technologies fail, Rest assured, there's one more technology that always works. No. <laughs> no. You have the experts. They know everything. And they will tell you. And even if they disagree amongst themselves, they'll still have the answer. But very rarely do you see an umpire in commentary, don't you? Very rarely do you see them actually support the, the umpire's decision. So remember I said technology is there to support human beings rather than replace them? It's a very interesting debate that's going on at the moment about the front foot. Now there's a challenge for you. Who can come up with a technology that can be put on the cricket field to pick up the front foot. Where I'd like to see that going is the umpires working on their own skill and training and development to make sure that we don't need technology for the front foot. And let's get it right in the first place. And I'm sure that's what most of them are doing. So it's always a balance and a blend between human beings and technology. But if technology fails, these guys will always give us the answer. So, here's some really important stuff to think about. I would like you to think about how you could take some of these messages and apply them to what you do next in your chosen field. Things like that word that I mentioned before called adaptability. 
how can you help us manage the change? How can you help us anticipate the change? A good captain is always at least one hour in front of the game. A good leader is always someone who can anticipate and see the vision of what's likely to happen next and anticipate the need. So there's our fruit machine. There's our snicko. There's our hotspot. There's our program feed. There's our run-out camera with our front foot. There's the pink ball. The game of cricket continues to change. And we need to embrace that change, but only when change is for good, when change adds value. There's no point changing for the sake of change. Sometimes we get gadgets and gimmicks with technology. They're not sustainable. The role of technology and what we do in change has to make our lives better and more sustainable. Not a gimmick. I'd like to talk briefly about things like hard work. There's no substitute for hard work. Absolutely none. If you want to get to the top in your chosen field, you must put in the hours. And yes, it does take roughly 10,000 hours to get to world class. It takes about 10 years to get to world class. Probably a little bit less for Sachin. A little bit less. But what we are finding with sports people particularly is they're starting younger. The parents are starting them younger. Have a think about focus. And when I'm saying these things... Don't think that you can't do it, because you can. So here's two umpires in Australia at the moment. They're both on our national panel. This one and this one. Are they the same? Are they the same? Chorda? Butter. These lessons, these things apply to everyone. Not just the big and not just the small. They apply to you. You need to focus on what you have to do and what you want to do and you have to commit fully to your chosen field. Not part-time, fully. And you have to commit in a way that you're genuine and honest with yourself about that. And you have to tell the people around you what you want to do as well because you need their help. So focus is very important. Patience. Patience is about when the opportunity comes along. Because you might be ready, but the opportunity's not there. So in umpiring, that's exactly the same. Patience is really important. So don't get frustrated when things don't happen in your time frame to where you want to get to. However, when that opportunity does come along, you need to be ready. That means that you need to be an elite panel umpire before the position becomes available. That means that you need to be qualified and ready for that job before it becomes available. Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't think that someone's going to come along and say, here's the perfect job for you, now start working hard. It doesn't work that way. You need to earn your stripes before that happens. Perseverance. Failure, setbacks, mistakes. Every good player, every top player, cricket player in the world has at some stage been dropped from their national team. I challenge you to tell me one top player that has not been dropped from their national team at least once. Even Don Bradman was dropped from Australia. So, you need to be resilient and persevere. Talked about hard work and self-belief, I've talked about that as well. Do you know who this man is here? Not? 
No, no, this man. Not Steve Buckner. He comes from Chennai. Sundaram Ravi. I first came across Sundaram Ravi in 2006 when I started some work with the BCCI. He joined the elite panel in 2015-16. It took us 10 years to get another Indian on the elite panel. But he did all this. He did all that. It takes some time. Okay. So, before I get to the next slide, do you know who this man is? Viru? Viru Bhaji. This was taken on a bus in 2014 for the Shane Warne Sachin Tendulkar T20 series in the UK, in the USA, New York, Houston, Texas, and LA. We finished our game in New York. We've taken the bus into Newark Airport. Our bus was going to take us onto the tarmac. So picture this. There's 30 of the world's best cricketers and a couple of umpires on the same bus. Lara, Tendulkar, Lakshman, Gooley, Saywag, Ponting, Warren, Akram, Ambrose, Walsh, need I go on? Pretty good players. Sat on the bus on the tarmac for nearly three hours. For nearly three hours because the US Transport Department didn't like a couple of names on the manifest. Now, two things happened related to attitude. Some people at the front of the bus, like a Ricky Ponting, were getting very upset and very angry about why is this so long, why are we taking so long, let's get out of here. I'm sitting down the back thinking I've got three hours in a closed bus with 30 of the world's best cricketers <coughs> to tap into. And so we talked about some really interesting topics. And one of those topics I threw at Viru and I said to Viru, we need some more umpires, how about it? He said, no, I don't think I could do that. I said, well, why don't you put your hat on? Put my hat on. So he put my hat on. And it fitted like a glove. It fitted like a glove. And then I told him what we were getting paid, and he took it straight off. <laughs> he didn't want to be an umpire. But the message was, we need you. We need you to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Technology and what you do next has to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Does that make sense? Okay, there you go. Now, I think that's about it from me. We're going to get into some Q&A, your questions, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about three or four key messages to finish up. Kush? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was quite an amazing journey it was, right? Sir, uh, from Cricket Viewer's perspective, we have few questions to ask you, sir. Could you please enlighten us with your answers? Gee, shut up. <laughs> Most of our students sitting here would love to know, th know about this, probably. You were still studying when you started your umpiring, right? So how did you manage both of them? With great difficulty. <laughs> When I, uh, when I finished school, I went straight into university and I was doing a Bachelor of Business degree at the University of Technology in Sydney. And I got to the end of year one and I realised that I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it. Long days, you know, tutorial nine o'clock in the morning and a tutorial at nine o'clock at night. That was my Thursday program. And I didn't enjoy it. So I had to make the tough decision and tell my mother that I was going to stop. And I stopped my university degree after one year. And then I went out and got a job. So 
in some ways one door closed and I made a tough decision and then the job that I took on board which I started as an administration cadet for a printing company five years later I'd worked my way up to production manager so it goes to show you that life's all about choice and if you're not enjoying something my advice to you is is to exercise that choice and to do what you love it's most and most important Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, moving on, uh, when you started your career, did you idolize someone, maybe someone like David Shefford, maybe Dickie Bird, someone like that? There are several people that I respected within my sport. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of umpires that I thought that were very good, but I was going to be my own person. I didn't start umpiring or my chosen field to try and be someone else because everyone else is taken. I had to be the best person that I could be and I looked at guys like David Shepherd or Rudy Kutzen or Daryl Hare and I looked at those people and I said, what do they do better than anyone else in my field? And what can I learn from them about their strengths and how can I apply that to my game? And I also looked at other successful people, tennis players, Formula One drivers, people who were world leaders in their own field and I looked at what made them successful and said, what can I learn from them to apply to my game? So please, be yourself. There's only one of you. Be the best you that you can be. Don't try and be someone else. That's a wonderful message, sir. <laughs> this is something probably every cricket fan wants to know. In a match, probably after making a decision, you realize that you did a mistake, probably. Many people very, very, very curious that, how do you process that? <laughs> very difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. I'm sure there's lots of people in the room that can remind me of some of my biggest mistakes. True? Sachin Tendulkar? 91. <laughs> Surav Ganguly? I've given the best players out incorrectly. Lots of mistakes. At the time, you do not see that they're actually learning opportunities. In 2004, I had my worst game of cricket at Trent Bridge. And one of the joys of being an international cricket umpire is that your worst game is going to be on TV and your worst game is going to be on TV. And that's very difficult from a pride perspective because I honestly own all of my mistakes and I take a lot of pride in my performance. So when I get something wrong, it hurts. For me, it's almost like losing a family member. I get very upset with myself uh, and I liken it a little bit to uh, the grieving process that you go through when you learn that you've done something wrong or you've lost a loved one or whatever. There is a grieving process. I own my mistakes. They hurt. So what I would encourage you to do is to try to think more rationally about making mistakes and less emotionally about them and try to make sure that you see them as learning opportunities. They're hard at the time. But if you're able to talk to your colleagues about them, learn from them, take out those little nuggets of gold, they're still going to hurt. But you'll get through that mistake process a lot faster and get back on the bike, as we call it, and be able to actually be a better professional as a result of it. Does that make sense? Tigger? Moving on. Um, I had come across a funny incident um with your son. <laughs> you think the players are hard on my decisions. I've umpired my children at junior cricket. <laughs> I have three kids. Uh, they're currently 19, 17 and turning 12 shortly. Two boys and a girl. My eldest daughter, or my daughter at the moment, she's 12. She's actually playing cricket, under 12s with the boys. Loves it. She's a bowler, a wicket keeper and a batsman all together. <laughs> she loves it and to be honest I, I find the women cricketers, the female cricketers so refreshing because their humility and sense of fair play is fantastic. You know they can get out for zero and they're still punching each other with the gloves on the way out saying well done, good try. You know it's just it's, it's really refreshing to see that type of uh, spirit within the female cricketers. But back to your question. I was umpiring my eldest son, under 14s. I'm just a dad 
on this day. I'm not, a, I'm not a cricket umpire, I'm just a dad. I'm just helping out. So I'm there umpiring him and he's bowling from my end. He appeals. Bahane. Not out. Now, I could see all three stumps. I could see all three stumps. And there was space for a couple more. <laughs> And I said, not out. And he turns around and he goes, oh, Dad. <laughs> now, it didn't stop there. Then he proceeded to yell to his mother on the sideline, I don't want Dad to umpire my cricket anymore. So I said, there's your cap, there's the counter, you do it. <laughs> So my children are my strongest critics. I don't get that on the cricket field. We did have a code of conduct hearing that night after dinner at home. Well, for those who thought that umpiring is an easy job, well, your own son won't accept your decision. Welcome to reality. Tough school. Yep. So, so the next one is from hardcore cricket fans. So you have been there for quite a long time now. What is that one cricket law which you would love to change? or something which is unfair? Yeah, for those of you who do not know, but I do sit on the MCC Laws Subcommittee. So if you don't like a law, chances are it's my fault, because I'm part of that group. But please don't send me laws questions. OK, I've got enough of those. But I, one law that I would change would be the leg by law. For me, I just find it strange that the batting side get runs for not being able to hit the ball. It's true, yeah. This is a game between bat and ball. Why do you get runs for not being able to hit the ball and then moving the ball away from the fielding side? <laughs> Seems a bit strange to me. Well, I lost that argument on the committee, so okay. here we are. OK, OK. Uh, so one of those things which, which is very misunderstood is spirit of the game. I know that it's a huge topic to Big talk topic. about. But uh, it'll be very helpful for our young cricketers to know about what exactly it is. Yeah, it is a big topic. I'll try to be very brief with it. For me, the spirit of the game is all about behaviour. It's all about doing the right thing. Now, sometimes doing the right thing means different things to different people. For me, the spirit of the game and player behaviour is the responsibility of the captain and the team. It should not be an umpire's problem. But sometimes we get given that responsibility that we have to act. I was lucky enough to be in Chennai a few days ago and I visited Ashwin's Academy and I was given the opportunity to speak to them about the spirit of cricket and the way I asked and dealt with this topic with them was, I said to them, what do you think the game expects? And they threw answers at me like, respecting the opposition, respecting the umpire's decision, not swearing at other players, <laughs> being gracious in victory and defeat, making sure that we lead by example and we don't do things that actually brings the other team down or offends the other people or players. We make sure that we thank the curators. We appreciate the scorers. And I said at that point, make sure you thank your mum and dad for bringing you here today. So the spirit of cricket is lots of those things and there's no wrong answer there. But the spirit of cricket is about how we play. And it's about being good people, as, as I said before, and making sure that that word respect is central about what we do and the way that we do it. Humble in victory, gracious in defeat and making sure that we don't actually, I suppose, ruin the game for the people that follow us, that we actually add value to the game for the people and the generations who come after us that want to play it. And so the spirit of cricket is actually about bringing an enormous love to the sport and making sure that it's not only the result that counts, it's how we play. Does that make sense? Tika? Is that all yeah? <laughs> Maybe a lot of people <laughs> have questions, I guess, yeah? Before taking, one last question, sir. 
everyone talks about the workload of the players but it's very less talked about umpire's workload you will be away from home away from family how how is that sacrificed you know takes a toll yeah also some of those photos up there you might have seen that you know you're away from home for long periods of time so roughly 180 to 210 days a year as an elite panel umpire you know and then you might have IPL on top of that so it's one of the the downside of our jobs but it's also in a lot of ways a good thing I think one of the great things about cricket is that the conditions aren't the same, that there actually is a home ground advantage. That I think, you know, you go to different parts of the world or even different grounds in Australia and none of them play the same. And I think we talked about that word adaptability. And, and good players, the best players in the world are able to adapt to the different conditions and be successful. And I think that's a great challenge within the game. Should the toss decide the outcome of the game? The answer is no. Should the balance between bat and ball be more equal? Yes. Should the conditions be the same? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the session. I had a question, uh, a two-part question. First, you said you were going to tell a few stories about. So I just wanted to know a typical instance with uh, um, Dhoni, for example, or Virat that you could share with us, you know, getting into their minds because they are world-class cricketers or maybe um, even Stephen Smith. And the second part was, uh, the, to the question was, uh, there is a thin line between uh, being competitive and, you know, going overboard. So if you historically see, you come from a land of uh, the uh, country where they have been into sledging, and I love the fact that they are so enth enthusiastic about <laughs> this. But when do you sort of realize when this part? I like that too. <laughs> I like that too. You see, I'll, I'll deal with your second question, second part first. Because test cricket should be test. It's a hard form of cricket. It's, it's, uh, it's a long form of the game that's more about mental than it is about physical, although that stamina thing I talked about earlier on. And I love the fact that it is hard. Because if it was easy, everyone could do it. But it's not supposed to be easy. That's why they call it a test. Um, but I do, I do like it when players are, are hard. I enjoy when they challenge each other and they challenge me. I enjoy that. But there is a, a point at which players reach where it becomes either personal or overly aggressive or borders on physical violence. There is no place in our game for that. But can they unsettle? Can they banter? Can they try to get in the minds of the opposition players? I've got no problem with that as a cricket umpire. I love to see hard cricket. I love to see the personalities in the game of cricket. They're all great. So I'll get back to your first part now about Dhoni. He is a personality in the game of cricket. MS Dhoni, for me, is one of the, the smartest cricket minds that I've come across in the game of cricket. I don't say that because he's Indian. I say that because that's the way I see it. He is an incredible um, strategic thinker and got a great cricket brain. But he also has a great temperament. He also has tremendous composure. And in a country like this, and this is what always amazes me about your top cricketers, is that they're under so much scrutiny and so much pressure from people like you <laughs> to win and to perform. But when you speak to them, when I'm lucky enough to speak to them, they're very well grounded. And I'm putting people like Rahul Dravid, Anil Kumble, MS Dhoni in this category where they are very easy to talk to. And a very brief story about MS Dhoni. So we've come off a test match in, Derb in um, Kingsmead, Cape Town, where one of my uh, good friends, Sri Santh, um, <laughs> had just... <laughs> I had just finished playing a game there and we actually had to, to find Dhoni for slow over rates because Shri takes about seven or eight minutes to bowl an over. Oh. And we're sitting in the dressing room, the umpires and MS Dhoni, and we're talking to him about over rates and that if he breaches again in this test match in Durban, he's likely to have a holiday. <laughs> he said, 
that's okay, I need a holiday, I'd like <laughs> to have a game off. And then he said, but Tree's not playing this game, so don't worry. <laughs> but just the way that, and he was sitting back in this black leather chair, and he was more interested in the quality of the chair, and thinking, I'd like to take this chair home, is there any chance I could take this and we're trying to talk to him about overrates and about missing a game and he was just so relaxed and so... Comp that's MS Stoney for you. You know, he's just... In your vast career as a cricket umpire, I would like to ask you how do you uh, understand when a controversy is building up and how do you proceed to control it? Good question. Thank you for asking that. Something in here is called experience. Because every situation is a bit different. And part of our preparation leading into a game is to think about the context, like what I said before about what happened the previous game, or what sort of issues might be building from the series, and reading the game and understanding the situation. And there's a fine line between stepping in too early and stepping in too late. If I step in too early and misjudge it, it goes from player versus player to player versus umpire. And if I step in too late, you've lost control entirely and it's very hard to get it back. So I use what's called my gutometer, another form of technology. <laughs> but this is mine and it comes from experience. And experience is what you get when you make lots of mistakes. So coming up through just like a player through grassroots cricket, you make lots of mistakes and you learn from your own experiences and you learn from your colleagues. And you watch things on TV and say, what would I have done? Would I have done anything differently? And you learn from that. And then ultimately, some of the best techniques of actually just settling a situation down might be. <laughs> so you don't need to say anything. You might just need to shut up eye contact, get people's attention or ask them a question. And sometimes I've asked the following question and I'll say to someone like Gautam, Gautam there's a match referee up there watching, would you like to have a holiday? <laughs> and that's all you've got to say, hopefully. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Let's have one from there. Uh, oh. My question is, uh, Virat Kohli and Sachin, like, they are good in their field and they are tremendously active and they are stars for Indian uh, cricket lovers. Sure. So, uh, my question is, uh, the Virat is continuously breaking Sachin's record. Do you think that he is setting new benchmark? One thing about records that we know is that they are always there to be broken. And as I said before, the game keeps changing. So we're playing more and more cricket these days than we've ever played before, which people have to respond to. So I saw Virat a couple of weeks ago in Sydney. He amazes me how fit he is, how flexible and agile that he is, and he has to be that way because of the amount of cricket that he plays. So it may have come to a shock to most of you last match in Adelaide where he did not score 100. He scored 100 today. He scored 100 today. Today, yeah. I don't know, I don't know how good Virat can be. I was lucky enough to be doing a one day international in Hobart several years ago where he was playing against Sri Lanka at that stage in a tri-series and he scored a hundred and something. I couldn't tell you what he scored, you could, I couldn't. But he hit every ball in the middle of the bat and I mean every ball. He's a talented player and he's someone that's got tremendous ability. How far he goes is up to him. Because I don't know how good he can be, I don't know how long he can play for. But remember I talked about that concept of try? You just don't know. You don't know what your ceiling is and I don't think Virat knows what his ceiling is. In the same way Sachin probably didn't know. But if you just keep getting better every game, like a cricket umpire, all we should be doing is getting better every game, as a player, every game, every day we do something a little bit better, then we don't know how far we can go. So we've got to keep pushing. Thank you.
I think the question was, which two teams do I want to see qualify for the World Cup? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Finals. Finals. Final. Thank you for the question. I don't care who wins. Because <laughs> he's an umpire. Yeah. But I do know, I do know there will be one team in the final, and that's my team. <laughs> So there are three teams in the final. Our team's going to be represented. I know we'll be there. We need to make sure we have the best game possible. As for the other two, I don't care. Hello, sir. Hello. I want to ask you, what is your future cricket technology wish list? Future technology wish list. That's a good question. I didn't think about that one. Future technology wish list. In some ways, I wish there would be less technology <laughs> because I like to be an umpire. I like this. It's our job. It's what we do. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that because we don't really have a say in what technologies there's going to be because that's normally determined by the broadcasters because they pay the money. And, uh, but I did give you a challenge before about front foot technology. So I'd probably look at that one. But again, I'm looking for technology that supports us, not replaces us. So that's probably why I'm thinking about a bit less. Is there a question up the back, perhaps, that we can take? Yep, back benches, please. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Where are you? Can't see you. Yeah, it's around there. Do you go? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. In test matches, um, um, a game goes six hour long a day. Oh, plus. So, so how Slow do you keep rates. yourself calm in those conditions? Yep. And secondly, what are your views about current India versus Australia test? <laughs> 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 I like the first part of your question. Not sure about the second part of your question. <laughs> so if I understand your question, we have very long days in cricket, very long games, test matches. And so what we need to do and Lokesh, you asked me this question the yes, other day. Yeah. Can, can we umpire five balls at a time? Can we umpire six hours at a time? No? What do you do every night when you have something to eat, when you go out and have dinner and you have a plate of food? How do you eat that plate of food? One bite, One bite at a time. Very good, young lady. That's all I try and do in my six and a half hours of cricket 90 overs is I just try and umpire one ball at a time and try and focus for a little bit of bite-sized chunks. If I walk out there to start a test match and think about five days, 15 sessions, 30 hours of cricket plus low over rates, that's a lot. I can only umpire one ball at a time. So I go out there to umpire one ball, one over, one hour, have a break. Then I start again. One ball, one over, one hour, then I have lunch. And when we run out of balls, we go home. <laughs> so it's exactly what you need to do in your work, for your big tasks, for your working week, is we do bite-sized chunks. As for your second question, about Australia and India, I don't care. <laughs> I do. I mean, I want the cricket to be good. And I think what's really good about this series so far is they're pretty close. And I think that's good for cricket. And I'm also seeing the focus and the commentary on the players and less about their behaviour. And I think that's good too. That's good. One last question. Can you probably pass the mic? Mic. <laughs> Go on. Quick. Mic, mic, please. One what last. What do you think about the application of soft signals and umpires call in today's game? What do Why I think? We have the means to precisely know what's going on in the field. Yep. Do we still need them? Yeah. So, what do I think about soft signals and the rest of it? I think what's really important is the umpire still has to make a decision. And if you take away the soft signal and you're going to let technology just make the decision, What's the role of the umpire? So I think it's really important
for the umpires to make decisions in the first place. Then, if technology is not able to show conclusively what the outcome is, and I believe that there was a doubtful catch today, I didn't get to see it in my room, but I believe that there was, if you don't have the soft signal to start with, where does that leave you? Who gets the benefit of doubt? The batsman, but the umpires made a decision. So this is the integrity of the sport that's fundamental and important. There are three things I'd love you to take away from today's session to apply to what you do. Har sume uk krisht raho. Ha sume uk krisht raho. Be excellent all the time. So whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you're turning up for a meeting, whether you're having a conversation with someone, whether you're preparing for an exam, everything that you do has to be of an excellent standard. Don't pick and choose when you're going to be excellent. Have high standards in everything that you do. For me, when I started at umpiring, I couldn't just put that uniform on on the Saturday and be excellent. I had to be excellent Monday to Friday. And that's a pursuit. That doesn't happen overnight. That's a journey. So, har sume uk krish raho. Be excellent all the time. Number two. Apna rasta dando. Apna rasta dando. Find a way. <coughs> find a way. If it's not working, find a solution. Don't be satisfied with second best. If you want to be number one, train like you're number two. Find a way. <coughs> Never be satisfied. Third one, tin. Simple. Rako. Keep it simple. Cricket is a simple game. But we do very well to make it complicated. We overcomplicate a simple game. As a cricket umpire, all I have to do is watch the ball. Use these, use these, engage this, and make a decision. And most of the time, we got it right. Most of the time. Sometimes we overcomplicate the game unnecessarily or we overthink situations. We put pressure on ourselves to be something or someone or somewhere that we're not. Keep in the present. So when you're making a decision like me behind the stumps, your mind needs to be where your body is, behind the stumps. Not in the future, not in the past, but in the present. Keep it simple. Just watch the ball. So in what you do, and the technology work that you do, whatever you design, make it idiot-proof. Keep it simple. Tika? Thank you very much again, sir, for these three brilliant messages. I hope all of you take it home and excel in whatever you are doing. Now, I'd like to request uh, Roshan Thated to present the memento as a vote of thanks and gratitude.